Welcome, everybody. This is a, I'm really excited to be here with you today. This is an, a, an event that's part of the Open Publishing Fest, which we're really excited to participate in. I'm Steel Wagstaff, and I'm the Educational Product Manager for Pressbooks. And Pressbooks is a, an open source book publishing platform that lets people print, publish books to the web in lots of different export formats and make them available to readers in, all, in lots of different ways. So what I want to talk about today and what I'm really excited to show is the kind of end-to-end -end process for creating uh, an open access anthology of material that's in the public domain or that would be Creative Commons licensed. So my background comes from English literature. I got my PhD in American literature. And I know there's a lot of other disciplines that are commonly taught in universities where the primary texts and the material that's taught is already in the public domain, meaning that it belongs to all of us. It's no longer protected by copyright. So for example, if you teach literature courses, many literature courses feature literature that was published before 1924, uh, which is the kind of cutoff date for works in the United States generally. Uh, it's also true of history courses or political science courses or law courses. There's a lot of subjects uh, that are taught in the university where the primary texts and the objects of study are themselves in the public domain. And in all of those cases, what instructors may want to do is provide a low or no cost reader made up of primary text for students to study. Previously, it was sometimes pretty difficult. You'd want to assign a text, but maybe the Dover Thrift Edition or something like that. It still had a cost for learners, even though the material is in the public domain, because printing and distributing materials has a cost. But uh, using digital tools like Pressbooks and other publishing platforms, you can now make totally free open access readers quite easily of material that's in the public domain. And I kind of want to show what that process looks like from end to end. So when I say quite easily, kind of what I mean by that. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and I want to show you kind of one of the, the OG pro projects that are kind of uh, anthologies of American literature. Uh, Robin DeRosa, who teaches at Plymouth State in New Hampshire, several years ago worked with a bunch of her undergraduate students and they were working to kind of build a replacement or a kind of comparable version to one of those large introductory uh, American anthology, or American literature anthologies. So when I went to school, I, took, I bought the Norton, a big behemoth of a book that cost me a lot of money. And so Robin and her students built this open anthology of earlier American literature. And you can see that it has an introduction. It's got several sections on Native American texts. And, and then it's got a section on Columbus, Cabeza de Vaca. And then, you know, it takes you through early American history and literature. If we were to jump into Thomas Paine, you could see it starts with a video about Thomas Paine that a student put together. Uh, and then the next chapter is an introduction that another student wrote, has some images, it has some discussion questions. And then here's an excerpt from Thomas Paine's Common Sense, which is in the public domain. And the whole book was built like this. Robin later wrote a really nice uh, story, kind of narrative, talking about what her experience was like putting this book together and working with students to make an open anthology and practicing open pedagogy. But I, let's say I want to start with this book. So I say, I really like this book that Robin and her students made. And I would like to bring it into my own instance of press books and do something with it. So the first thing that I would do here is I would come to any instance of press books that I have access to. So here we have a press books network. And what I'm going to do is the press books cloning operation. You'd say clone a book. And I want to say, let's, what's the source URL? So let's start with this American literature anthology. We'd add the URL here, and we're going to start by saying, this is going to be called Steele's Anthology. Steele's Anthology of Open Literature. And then I'm going to say clone it. Now what's happening here is that this Pressbooks network here is going to this URL, where Robin's book is, and says, do you have a book here that's public? And Pressbooks will say yes, via its API. And then it will say, does this book have an open license? And if we looked at Robin's book, you'll see this was published under a Creative Commons attribution license. So it says yes. And then it says, okay, give me the book. And so it will start by cloning the entire book. It'll make an exact copy and allow me to edit, revise, adapt, remix, all of the kinds of permissions that I have with open licenses. So it's going through this process. There's a hundred and something chapters in this book, so it'll take about a minute. And you can see now I have an identical clone of Robin's book now available for me. So that's the first step. If I look at this book here, um, you'll see in just a second that I have, if I visit this book, at this new Steele's Anthology URL, an exact copy of the book that Robin and her students made with all of the attributions and all of the content in place. 
the next thing I might want to do is to come into that book and clean it up or to do something different with it. Like I might decide, you know, I don't actually want this section on Columbus. So I'm going to trash this chapter, this introduction. I'm sorry, student. That was great work you did, but it doesn't fit in my anthology. So I'm going to trash that chapter. I'm going to trash this chapter. And uh, I'm going to then trash the section or the, or the part that it's in. And I might decide, you know, I actually want to do this glue scap went to English and England and France chapter a little bit earlier. So I'm going to move this up and put it above the Penebscot chapter. That's the order that I want this content to appear. in. The next thing I may want to do is to say, okay, now I've started with this book, but I also learned that Timothy Robbins has been overseeing this big project that took Robbins anthology and her students anthology and has totally improved it or made it bigger and added lots and lots of new chapters. I might say, let's take, you know, 10 chapters from this book. So I'll come and I'll grab that URL. And here in the cloned book, I'll then come to tools, import. And we can bring content from lots of different sources into Pressbooks. Here in this case, I have an existing Pressbooks book. So I'm going to choose this option here and tell it to import from the URL. At this point, I'm going to say begin the import. And what it will do is it will say, okay, I think I found another Pressbooks book with an open license. And it will show me all of the available content that I could bring in. So here I'm going to say, I actually really like this section on pre-contact. And I want that section and all of those chapters. I'll leave the Columbus one that I have, but, uh, or I don't want Columbus. I want everything but Columbus. Okay. And I'll say, here's the only piece of content that I want from this book is this part and these chapters. And I'll come down to the bottom and I'll say, okay, I'm ready to go. Let's import this into my existing book. So you can see we're doing a kind of a hybrid method here where we started with a pure clone and now we're importing from another source. So we're making a remix. This process is very similar to the one you saw. It's going to take me a few seconds to go to that web URL and grab that content. And now you'll see, okay, there's this brand new section that I just brought in, uh, which will be probably at the bottom or the pre-contact, contact and colonization. And here are the chapters that I just cloned from that other book. And you'll notice they came in with all of their attribution and licenses preserved. Um, and that's the kind of first step in remixing a book. The next thing that I may want to do is I may want to say, okay, so I brought in content from this Pressbooks book. Now I found yet another book. And this book is cool because this is actually, uh, if I wanted to do a bilingual anthology, clearly not everybody who is writing American literature was writing it in English. There have been people on this continent writing in indigenous languages and telling stories in indigenous languages. And there were for many years people on this continent who were writing and telling stories in French and Spanish, two other prominent colonial languages on the continent. And here there's a professor at the University of Oklahoma who's also made a very cool anthology of Hispanic literature. Here this book has been published with Pressbooks. It has an open uh, Creative Commons license. So I could have used the same method there previously. But there's another option too, which would be, let's download the XML file. They've made the XML file available, and I'll show you what an XML import looks like if you have an XML file. What's nice about this is that this will work for both WordPress websites that produce XML exports, as well as Pressbooks books, since Pressbooks is built on WordPress. So I can come back here, and here I'm going to choose the import uh, XML option. And here I'll select Pressbooks XML. I'm going to select the file that I just downloaded. So I've selected that XML file. And when I begin the import, a very similar routine will come on for me. I'll say, okay, what do you want to bring in here? And here I'm going to say, I'd like to bring in the chat, the section on Soruani and Estela Cruz. So I'll bring in that part and those three chapters. So those are the pieces of content I'm bringing in here. Again, the routine and the process is pretty similar. So I've just built the text out of a bunch of open press books, books that I found. At this point, we may say, okay, this is really cool. The other thing that I wanted to show is a lot of very interesting examples for what's possible and what you can make. Instead of it just being just a text project, this is one of my favorite projects that I've ever seen. So this was, this has been largely built by Naomi Salmon. And Naomi Salmon was a graduate student of mine when I was at the University of Wisconsin, a friend and a colleague. She wrote her PhD in 19th century English literature. And as one of the projects she's working on, there's this novel called The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. When it was published, it was initially published in installments as a serial in a series of newspapers. And so Naomi is building this open critical edition of the Wilkie Collins novel and printing it as it would have been printed in this book for the installment readers. So here you'll jump in and you'll say, okay, here's the first installment. She gives you some context. 
she's added a big H5P activity with annotated uh, to help kind of explain what you're seeing when you read this image. And you say, okay, this is how this works. Let's go to the next chapter and we'll see the very first installment of The Woman in White. And you're reading it as it would have been presented to you in the newspaper. The next thing that she does is she's turned on this tool called Hypothesis. It's an annotation tool. And this is built into Pressbooks. So you can do open annotation. This is an annotation that anyone in the world could view and read. And you can build annotation into this tab. So let's say I want to do something like that in my book. Naomi also has written, I want to highlight this, her dissertation was about re-envisioning how people can de democratically participate in 19th century studies. And she's thinking about open access and public domain texts as a key part of that. I think Naomi's brilliant and I love the work she's doing. I think you may find it inspiring too. So let me drop this in the chat before I get too much further. Um, if you also want to follow along, she's also started a very cool Twitter project called the 19th Century Open Pedagogy Project, which is kind of highlighting some of these practices and how people can get more involved in reading, discussing, engaging with public domain literature, kind of our cultural heritage. And she has a really cool community that she's built on Rebus Community all around this project. And so here is where she can talk about what are the next things that we're going to do. We're going to build some ancillaries. We're looking for editors. And they're in the peer review and feedback stage of that project that anyone in the world can join and participate in. So some ideas for how you might want to do this if you're building a collaborative anthology. This was the same method that that uh, earlier open anthology of American literature used when Tim Robbins was remixing and improving the initial text that Robin DeRosa and her students. Okay, so to turn on hypothesis, let's go back to where I was at. Let's say, oh, in this book, here's an example of a cool literature activity that I built. So I'm teaching a poem uh, by Lorraine Niedeker. It's got all these annotations and all this cool stuff in it. Let's clone this and put it in my anthology as well. So we'll come in and we'll say tools import. We'll make this uh, another URL import and it will find this chapter and ask me what I want to bring in. So when I clone it, you'll notice a couple of differences. When you first clone something, Pressbooks will bring in all of the content that was there, the text boxes, the glossary terms, the H5P quiz questions, except you'll notice that in the original, I had all of these great annotations. And the annotations don't automatically clone when I clone a chapter because annotations will be anchored to this URL. So the first thing I want to do is first turn on the annotation capabilities. In a book, you can do that very simply by coming to settings, hypothesis, and then decide where do I want people to be able to use the hypothesis annotation client. In this case, I'll say they can use it in parts, chapters, front matter, back matter. Or you could get really granular, but I'm just going to go very generic. So now I come back to my anthology, and now when you visit this anthology and view, when I open this chapter, if I were to select some text, you would see this annotation client pop up. So anybody in the world can view or make annotations now without having to install additional software. It's just built into the textbook project. The problem, though, is the original, I had already made all these cool annotations. They live on this book, but they don't yet live on this book. What's really neat about Hypothesis is just like Pressbooks, it's an open source project, and it has an API and a bunch of tools that allow you to clone and migrate things. So one thing that has been done, John Udell, who works at Hypothesis, has built a bunch of different tools to help you do cool things with annotation. And one of them is a copy annotations tool. So I'll drop this link in here so you can have it if you want to try it at home. But what I'll do here is I'll say, okay, I've already logged in as myself as a user, and I'm going to say, what's the source domain that I want to grab these annotations from? Well, here's the original book, and where do I want to put them? I want to put them on my new book. And I want to take only the annotations that are in the public layer, though I could get any private group. So with annotations, you can make them in public, or you could put them in a private group. So if I were to log in, you could see I have an English class, and I could have private annotations here. I could have copied just the private annotations. But in this case, I'll say, let's just get the public ones. Let's move them to the public, and let's do 25 at a time. Let's check my settings. It's going to let me review the annotations. Let's copy them. It's fetching. It found 17 annotations. It's copying them over. And now it's going to say, check results. Let's view this book. So this newly cloned book, you'll now notice, I did it right. 
here are 17 annotations. I moved them from this book over to this book. So even if you have annotations and other kind of rich text that you have made that you want to move over, individual users can copy their notes when the book moves or gets cloned or remixed. The remix can have a lot of the work and energy and effort that you poured into this. So far, I've mainly focused on getting content out of press books. But if, you're, if you know you're teaching material in the public domain, a lot of times you're finding it in the public domain and you're figuring out how do I bring it to press books. One really common way would be, for example, uh, I'm here at Project Gutenberg. In that Nita Kerr poem, she's writing about a Native American leader named Black Hawk who was involved in the Black Hawk War in the 19th century in Wisconsin. And Black Hawk went on to write a, a, an autobiography or have it ghostwritten. Maybe I want to include this book or an excerpt from this book in my anthology. I found it here at Project Gutenberg and I've got a couple of options. One, Project Gutenberg is giving me the EPUB and the EPUB is great because an EPUB file is basically just a zip file with a bunch of HTML documents in it and a manifest that says where everything lives. So I'm going to download this EPUB from Project Gutenberg. Now I'll come back to Pressbooks. I'll come back to my admin interface. And here I'll say settings, or sorry, tools, import. And I'm going to bring in an EPUB at this point. So let's choose the file I just downloaded. And we'll begin importing it. So what Pressbooks has done is it says, okay, you gave me an EPUB. The EPUB told me it had these chapters. Which ones do you want to bring in? And I'll say, let's bring in the first two sections and let's take a look at them. So I've just imported two chapters of Blackhawk's autobiography from Project Gutenberg. And often when I bring in content from other sources, we'll then need to take a look at it and do some cleanup. So here you can see there's a bunch of prefatory material that I can just select and delete. Here's the autobiography, the title page, copyright page, and affidavit. And, you need to see. and then they've included their internal table of contents. I may want to delete that. And we'll say here's the original dedication. Uh, that looks cool. And then here's a translation that's provided in English. It's looking good. And what this book has been doing is it's been putting several chapters kind of all in one chapter. So I might say, you know, actually, I want to do this a little differently. Let me select this whole chapter and move it to a new chapter. So. I'm going to select this and, cop and, and exit out. I'll save this as the preparatory material. And then I'm going to say add a new chapter. And I'll just paste the other stuff that I got from the chapter. It's called Autobiography of Blackhawk. So I'll call this Autobiography of Blackhawk. And I've made a new chapter here. And I could continue cleaning up content and making sure that it looked the way I wanted it to look. I'm going to give it a preview and say, how did this chapter look? This looks pretty good. This came in directly from Project Gutenberg. And the EPUB is just text. It looks pretty well formatted. And if I needed to, I could just select something and say, annotate. Let's check on the spelling of Namaki here. Is that correct? So I could leave a proofreading note. And I could put it in a, let's put it in my uh, editorial layer. So me and uh, some students or whoever's working on this text together could build annotations and could work on the editorial, the cleanup process, et cetera. Another kind of common task might be, let's say I'm at Project Gutenberg and I have a poem. Now, poems are really difficult to typeset and format on the web. So here's an example of a poem from Gene Toomer from his novel Kane, where you can see the second and third lines of each stanza have been indented. I'm going to grab this poem from the HTML file, and I'm going to make a new chapter. And I know the poem is called Georgia Dusk. So I'll say Georgia Dusk is the name of the chapter. And I'll paste it. And as you know, as I pasted it, it just it, it lost all the formatting here. So what I'll do is I'll say, let's create this and then take a look a bit closer. One thing you'll notice is if I switch over to the text editor, when I brought it in, it brought in all of these extra divs. So the way that they were styling it was with a ton of divs. That's not generally really great. So let's turn this back on. And instead of pasting that, there's a feature here where I can just do, let's paste this plain text. So I'll come back in and I'll just grab this content here, the same thing. And I'm going to paste it again. And this time it's just plain text. So that's a good first step. So if I look at this, it's just plain text. 
I can turn that paste element off, and I've got this poem as a bunch of plain text. The next thing I would do is I'd say, okay, let's make stanzas. So I come back through and I make some entries. Okay, this is looking better. And I'm going to save this. Now, when it comes to lineation and line breaks, poetry is real difficult. So if I were to enter, let's say, five spaces and save this, what's probably going to happen is the editor is going to strip those out and say, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't actually make spaces as you intended. So there's a couple of ways that you can handle this. Either you can insert what's called the non-breaking space character. In this case, it'd be non-breaking space. You can add one here. Or I could also come in this text and I could say, let's wrap this whole thing in what's called a pre-element. Uh, Pre-element's really nice to know about when you're doing poetry because it means pre-formatted text. And then when I enter spaces, it will preserve them after the document's saved. So I'll say, let's go pre, let's turn this into a pre-formatted document. And I will respect Gene Toomer's original lineation for this poem. So now when I save this, rather than those spaces being removed, when I load this chapter, you'll see, oh, look, all of those spaces match the spaces entered as I could see them here in the original document. The document's going to look a little bit strange because the pre-formatting has its own style, but I can change that later with CSS, and I'm happy to show that in more detail if you want. So this is, at a glance, like how you could get content from an HTML document, how you could get it from an EPUB document, how you found internet stuff that's available on the web. The other thing that I could do is I could say, oh, look, here's the Wikipedia article about this novel. So I'm going to grab these two paragraphs. This is openly licensed um, because it's in Wikipedia. I could come back in. And I could add a little section here in the chapter where I go say uh, about Kane and make this a heading. And I'll paste this in and I'll put a little line break. And I could give attribution now. So in this case, the author of this piece here is Gene Toomer. So I'm going to create a new account contributor and I'm going to say Gene Toomer. And I'll add Gene Toomer as a contributor. Now when I come back to the chapter, I can say the chapter's author is Gene Toomer, and this is in the public domain. So let's save this and view the chapter now, and you'll see Georgia Dusk, Gene Toomer, and here's the poem. So you can see a little bit here, this work, Georgia Dusk by Gene Toomer, is free of known copyright restrictions, which is true because it was published before 19, it was published in 1923 actually. The next thing I might want to do is, okay, this is cool, the, the novel came. I found this really cool, uh, Gene's, uh, Gil Scott Heron has a, a song all about the novel came, recorded in 1978. You know, I like it. I might want students to know a little bit about this and see how this has influenced pop culture or African American vernacular culture in the 70s. So I could take this YouTube video, and I probably don't want to put it in the main body of the text, but I might want to say, let's make an annotation here. So annotate, and I'll say, check out this Kane-inspired song from Gil Scott Heron. And let's put this in the public layer. And then I'll paste that URL, post it to the public. And you can see now, I've got an annotation here where the video has been included in that annotation. And I might want to say, hey, students, instead of just reading this, I want to send you directly to this annotation. So I copy this URL. I close this window. I open, I send someone this link. They open it in a new window, or they open it if you wanted to go directly to this place. Let me make sure that the book is public. But that link should take you to um, the location for this, this uh, particular URL. And open up that annotation, and you'll be able to see it in context and show you for the book itself from the organized screen, you can toggle the book from private to public. Let's say I've done peer review and I'm ready to make this whole book public. This anthology, that URL should now be clickable and you can visit this on the open web. You could decide, hey, this chapter's not ready. So let's take it out of the public web version. It's not gonna be shown in the web, it's only gonna be shown to logged in users. So this way you could have a work in progress, you could have some public chapters, while you're preparing others for publication in the same book at the same time. 
I'm going to pause for a second and I'm going to look at the chat. I know that some stuff has come in that I probably missed. Okay, so earlier in the chat, Luann asked, are annotations no longer tied to the older URL? Okay, so when I did the copy annotation task, those old annotations remain there. But what I did was I said, okay, find those old annotations which have specific anchors and bring them to this new URL. And there, Hypothesis will try to find the matching strings. Now, if I had tried to copy those annotations to underlying text that was totally different, Hypothesis would say, oh, uh, we don't know where to put these annotations. They don't have anywhere to anchor. And so they would become page notes. So in, if, for example, um, you have a chapter where the annotation can't be anchored. So here in this particular case, we have both annotations which are anchored on specific text, like in the case of Nidaker, in the case of New Goose, or you can have what they call general page notes. So I could make a page note, which is just, this activity is about a poem by Harry Nidaker. Now, if I were to remove, if I were to edit the underlying text, so let's go and edit the underlying text, and let's say I remove this whole, this whole half part of this sentence, these two annotations, Jonathan Williams and Deidre Montgomery, will become orphaned. Let's remove this, this part of the sentence from my original. Clearly, those specific anchored annotations will have nowhere to go. And so you'll see, oh, the annotations for the chapter are still here. But you'll see there's an orphan. We don't know where to put this one. What should I do with this orphan? So that's a little bit about how annotations work. So either the display as orphans or as page notes uh, is my understanding for what happens there. The next thing that I want to show is, in addition to being able to import content from EPUBs, there's a couple other ways that you can get content in. So one common way would be to say, look, I've found a really great public resource that's open and licensed on the web, but it's not in Pressbooks. So for example, there's a really terrific um, textbook about American history that's in the, the CC license called The American Yop. And so I'm going to take this chapter about democracy in America, and I'm going to import this into Pressbooks. So the method here, I'd be, oh, it's a web page. So I will say import from URL, and I will give it that URL. Pressbooks will say, okay, we're going to try to see if we can parse that chapter. We can. And we'll say, let's import this into my book. So you can see that I just imported something from another website that had a, a Creative Commons license. And I've just brought this into Pressbooks. And we'll say, here's the Democracy in America chapter. And you'll notice, OK, the image didn't come in. So I need to manually get this image. Let's save this image to my computer. It has a little. I want to make sure I keep the attribution, so I'll come in and we'll edit this chapter. And here we'll say add media. We'll bring this image in. And so hopefully that just fixed it. And then you can see there's a bunch of other content in this chapter. I can revise it. I can clean it up. I can do other things with it. But that chapter and all of its footnotes and all the other links and things came into Pressbooks and look like they're going to display pretty nice. I can change the image size and do other things with it, but so far, so good, I've got a chapter that more or less matches what that open chapter was there. Another really common way of bringing content in is to, do, to work from Word documents. For example, many works will be in the public domain, but you may only have a PDF of them. So for example, if I went to Hathi Trust and I found a novel that I really liked, the Hathi Trust might give me a PDF of this open source work. And I'd say, thank you for the PDF, it's a nice scan of the book. I might have to OCR that PDF to so do optical character recognition and try to extract the text. So maybe I put it into a Word document and I clean it up and get it ready. If I have a Word document, I can also import that into Pressbooks. Here is a Word document, a word processing document. In the text, there's a heading that's been giving a heading one and there's a chapter. And you can see we have some short codes and other things that Pressbooks will format. And then you come down a bit further and here I have some text from Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis, which was also published early enough that it's in the public domain. Here's another chapter. There's more content here. Here's a third chapter with a heading. When I bring this Word document into Pressbooks, Pressbooks will try to parse those and recognize them as separate chapters. So here I'm going to select the file that I want. It should be called the chapter import file, and we'll say begin import. So here, just as you saw over here, it was 
chapter one, Gregor and his sister, etc. That's what Pressbooks thinks it's found as chapters, and I'm going to say let's bring those in as well. So you can see importing from Word works really smoothly and really quickly and very effectively as well. So here when I view this chapter, you'll see, okay, I brought in headings. In the initial document, I used some short codes to make these headings. So as long as I said, oh, I make that a subheading, and then you could say I created a footnote using the footnote shortcode. I made another heading. I made a block quote. I made a text box. I made a subheading, and I even made columns. And you'll see all of those things have been created as native kind of Pressbooks elements simply from a Word document here. You'll also notice that I brought in many chapters at once. So here's another chapter from Kafka. That all looks pretty clean and pretty good. Here's another chapter from Kafka's book. Looks clean and good. And then here's the last chapter that I brought in. So ultimately, bringing content in uh, can be done in a lot of different ways, a lot of different methods. Hopefully what you're seeing is something that will work for the situation that you're imagining or your instructors are imagining doing. You can bring content in from Word documents. You can bring content in from EPUBs. You can bring content in from websites. And you can definitely bring in content from XML or from other Pressbooks uh, in instances that live in the wild and in the world. And you can combine all of those into like a really delicious anthology mashup fairly quickly. Now I want to show you a little bit about what Pressbooks makes possible in terms of taking this text and giving you presentation and export options. So if we jump back into the Pressbooks interface, you'll see here in the back end, I've shown you just a little bit of the back end, you have this organize screen where you have your table of contents and can move content around and decide whether it's included in the web or included in the exports or not from this menu. You also have the ability to enter a bunch of metadata through book info. But what I want to focus on is the appearance piece. So when you come into a Pressbooks network, you'll see that there are a number of book themes. This will control the look and feel of the book in the web book and in your EPUB and PDF exports. By default, I'm using the McLuhan theme. But suppose in this case that I really actually prefer the Adunas theme. So I'm going to activate this. And you will notice the appearance of my book will change significantly. Previously, the, the typefaces were one way, and now they're a whole different set of typefaces with different sizes and styles. I just changed that by changing the theme. Within a theme, I also have a bunch of other options. So I might want to turn off part and chapter numbers, but I might want to put a two-level table of contents. And I might want to add script support for Biblical Hebrew and Ancient Greek if there's material in those languages in my book. I may want to display all the section licenses and the table of contents. And I can choose some customized colors if I'm using the text boxes in this chapter or in this book. So I've just changed some of the general options. And then there's going to be some web specific options. Let's make this book a little bit wider and let's change it so that paragraphs are indented. What you'll notice here when I reload is that the page, view, the page will get a bit wider and paragraphs will now be indented. So you just saw I changed the appearance just by changing some of those settings. And you'll now notice that any chapter that has multiple H1s will now have a bunch of subsections automatically created in the chapter. So I just made a new table of contents with subsections, which was really nice for making this book have a kind of deeper table of contents just by changing some of those global and web options. The real powerful tool, though, is the PDF options. Because if I'm imagining making this as a print text, I don't know InDesign really well. So making a good looking print book is hard unless you know design school. So we try to give you some very easy to use tools here that allow you to customize the appearance of your book. So I'm going to change the font size to 11 point. I'm going to change the body line height to 1.35. And rather than having this be a small digest book, I want the print book to be a US letter size. So I'll change the size of the print export. And I'm going to leave my margins. Let's actually make them. 1.5 1 1.5 centimeters. Oh, let's say two centimeters because that's telling me what I need to have. Otherwise, it'll get rejected. Two centimeters, two centimeters, two centimeters. I'm going to turn hyphenation on for this book. In the print book, I want to indent paragraphs. I want no blank pages. I do want a table of contents. And rather than footnotes, I want them to be chapter endnotes. And then I can customize the running header and footer if I want to. So I'll display on the left side, I'll put the book author for the front matter. And then for the chapters themselves, I'm going to put the chapter author as the running header and the chapter 
title is the running header on the, the left. And on the, I'm sorry, on the left page, what am I doing? Okay, chapter author and chapter title, that's what I want. Once I'm ready, I can come in and say, let's actually configure the look and feel of this book even further. So I can add custom CSS to control the web book, the ebook, or the PDF. In this case, I don't want to make any customizations, but I could do that here. And then I'll come to the export page. Here, what I want to make are two exports. I want to make a print PDF and an EPUB. So I click this button, and Pressbooks will take this huge book with a hundred and something chapters and turn it into an EPUB. And then it's going to take a huge book and make it into a very large PDF. I'm expecting this to be hundreds of pages. You'll notice that we support a bunch of different export formats. So you can decide what format you want this book to be available for offline access and make it in that format. And generally it will just produce without fuss, without error. I didn't do a ton of cleanup on this book, so there may be a couple of export validation errors. There, there are. I could look at the logs and clean those up. But the exports produce without error, so let's look at the EPUB or the PDF first. This is a big PDF, and you'll notice I just made a 543 page print book. And it looks pretty nice. Uh, here's my table of contents. It's big. It's a big book. The table of contents runs on for many pages. And then inside the book, here are the various chapters. So I made it, I made them as endnotes. So you'll notice that at the end of this chapter, here are my endnotes. Obviously, in a print book, if you had videos or interactive content, it will tell you we couldn't you put the interactive content in a print book, but here's where you could find it on the web, and it will give you a link and a, and a placeholder. In the case of a video, it'll give you an image placeholder. In the case of interactive content, it will say there was a quiz or a media element, you can find it at the URL. The last thing that you may want to do is if this is truly an open text, we can come into the sharing and privacy setting and say, yes, I want the most recent export files to be available from the book's website. Now when I visit my home page, you will see that anyone in the world, so let's log out. I'm no longer logged out. I just, I just come to this URL. You can find and download the EPUB and the PDF or any other export format you want to make available for your book which makes this book accessible to people without reliable internet connections. It makes the book portable, and it makes it really a durable, preserved, open access resource, as well as a fully interactive, uh, interesting web resource with annotation built in. Um, and that, that's kind of the end-to-end -end process for finding content, building an open anthology, changing its style and appearance, and then exporting and sharing those files freely. If you wanted to make this available for print on demand, I could take that PDF that I've made or the EPUB and submit it to anybody that sells print books or ebooks, either on print on demand or through a web service. And then if I come to the publish URL, I could say, oh, okay, I set up this with, I don't know, uh, Ingram Spark, and it's a self published service where you can buy a print on demand copy, or I set it up for Amazon. If you put the URL of the, let's just put a fake URL here. And let's say that was the URL you could go to buy this book. Now, when I visit the, the web home book, you'll see there's a link that says buy the book. And here it will show me where I could purchase the print on demand or the print copy of this book at whatever price I had set. So I might sell it at cost. I might say, oh, it's $7 to buy this print anthology. And you could buy it directly from a print on demand service or a URL. Maybe it's your library bookstore or someplace that you can buy this book in print. You can add those links and make it available for purchase as a print artifact uh, there. And that, in a 50-something minute nutshell, is the end-to-end -end stuff that I wanted to show about Pressbooks uh, and open source or open access public domain anthologies. I'll pause there and look to see if there's anything else in the chat or other questions, and we can get into wherever you want. Um, Valerie asked, how hard would it be to put that on Amazon as self-published, make it available as free on Kindle? Uh, not very hard. Uh, there are people that do that pretty regularly. So it's really up to you. I don't know what the Amazon rules are for whether you can give it away for free or whether you have to charge a nominal fee. For, I think you can do free Kindle stuff, but that's between you and, and Amazon. If you want to sell it in the Amazon store, it has to be the Amazon Mobi file format. So let me go back and share the screen. Mobis are basically proprietary EPUBs. I don't want to be too dismissive of it, but so when you make your export, 
to do the Amazon version, you'd have to click the Mobi file, and that's what Amazon will expect from you. Um, if you wanted to do a print-on-demand service like uh, Ingram Spark or uh, Lulu, you'd need to give them the print PDF. And generally, uh, our print PDFs, if you've input the, the HTML correctly, are going to be print and sellable ready. Uh, you can either purchase a bunch of copies yourself and distribute them however you want, or make it available as print on demand, whatever terms they give you as the print on demand provider. That's fairly common and there's a bunch of resources about that in our various guides. The question was, do you have tips for importing from OpenStax? This is kind of a complicated question. So historically OpenStax, uh, open, first come context, OpenStax is a leading publisher of very well produced professional uh, openly licensed textbooks in introductory disciplines. So they have something like 40 really outstanding, maybe 50, I don't know how many they have now, but really great, like full color, professionally done, openly licensed textbooks in introductory college subjects. They use, historically they've used uh, their own software that's called CNX Connections, and they use that as their publishing backend, and then they would produce zip files or PDFs for people to ingest. Um, there was, at one time, a plugin that would allow you to import the OpenStack zip files and try to import them into Pressbooks. It was not something that we had built, it was something someone had built from our open source community. And when that person, when the author of that plugin left his job uh, at BC campus, the plugin was no longer maintained and is now deprecated. So some people use that in their development environments to bring stuff in from zip files and then spent a lot of time cleaning it up. Right now, I'm aware of probably 35 to 40 books that had been brought into Pressbooks in that way and that now live in Pressbooks. BC Campus has done several dozen of them. I know that there's Jim Paradiso at Central Florida has done a couple more. Some people at SUNY uh, and um, other of the New York schools have done a few more. So they exist in the Pressbooks ecosystem already as Pressbooks books that other people have imported. I would really strongly recommend um, finding one of those existing OpenStax imports and just copying and cloning that. It'll save you tons of time. If there's a specific one you're looking for, you can probably ask on our community forum whether somebody has done it, or you could do a kind of uh, search to find OpenStax X title press books, and that would be how I would get it in. The, the, there's a couple of other options for doing this, but the big news in the OpenStax world is they just announced a few months ago that they're going to be releasing all of their titles as Google Docs. So once it's released as a Google Doc, it will be much, much easier for us to bring it into Pressbooks because you could use the Word, you could turn Google Doc into a Word document and import it. And we are also looking into and working on a direct Google Docs import method or routine. Uh, when OpenStax releases their library then, that would be even more attractive for us as a feature. So it's something we're thinking about and we'll be looking at more closely this summer. That was a long-winded answer to your question. Hopefully that got to where you wanted to go somewhere. Um, Jarrett asked in the chat, do you have any recommendations for OCR software? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's a couple of different tools, so it depends on your level of comfort and familiarity with the command line interface. For me now, I use, uh, I run a Ubuntu open source desktop operating system and I'm trying to learn more and more about open source software. And so I would use uh, one of the command line interface tools that you can run uh, basically an OCR utility on a PDF um, from the command line, and you can Google and search for kind of what, which one you prefer and you think works best. If you aren't really like that way inclined, which I wasn't until very recently, probably the best tool would be Adobe Acrobat Professional. So Adobe makes a really nice PDF reader, and the Acrobat tool is a PDF creator tool. Acrobat Pro, and I maybe even Acrobat Reader, has a very nice OCR conversion tool built in. And so um, when you, you can scan a document and turn a scanned document in, and you can uh, optical character recognize the, the words or the strings in that document. Depending on the quality of the scan, you can get very high accuracy on those OCRs. Um, and usually you can tweak and toggle the settings to, to get it right where you want it to go. Within Acrobat Professional, there's also a tool that will let you export or save the PDF document as a rich text file. And so I've done that on a number of occasions. So 
we, for example, there was a book that had been, when I was at Wisconsin, there was a book that had been published about the history of the University of Wisconsin system. The book was out of print, the publisher was defunct, and the author wanted to release it open access, but only had a print copy of the book. So they mailed the print copy of the book to us, and it was actually Naomi Salmon, who was my graduate assistant at the time. She went up and we scanned the book page by page. We brought the scan into Adobe Acrobat. We OCR'd the whole thing. We turned the document into a Google Doc, and then we cleaned it up, and then we made it a Word doc and imported it into Pressbooks. It took us a couple of weeks and a lot of labor, but in the process, we learned a lot about how to do this more effectively and efficiently. And I believe that Naomi has written about it or is writing about it currently in one of the links that I shared earlier, recommendations for that kind of uh, turning a PDF or a scan PDF into usable machine readable text. Uh, it's a big question and big issue. And a lot of times the public domain text you find will just be PDFs. And sometimes they'll just be scanned PDFs with very poor OCR. So the kind of textual quality and cleanup is a big part of what, what's, what's entailed with making an anthology. Uh, again, thanks everyone for your time and attention. We appreciate all that you're doing to support open education wherever you're at. If you have any questions about how Pressbooks could help support your open publishing initiatives or how you can uh, make the cultural heritage that belongs to all of us more accessible to more, please do let us know. Uh, I can be reached at steel at pressbooks.com or you can um, probably contact us through our website. Thanks for your time and attention and hope you all have a, a lovely rest of the week.